This is Gerardo Del Real with my partner in crime. Just kidding. No crime. The insightful, the smart, the law-abiding Mr. Nick Hodge. And this is episode five of Bizarro World. Nick, how are you? Trying to live a crime-free lifestyle, Gerardo. How are you? That's it. That's it. I'm doing well. Last week, you and I spoke. You talked about me not getting you going on the NFL because you'd get off on a rant. I want to talk markets. I want to talk Mr. Bezos from Amazon. I think that's going to be fun to talk about. But before that, did you get a chance to see the Super Bowl? Do you care? I did see the Super Bowl. Uh, I don't really care, but... um... It was good to see some man nipples instead of some woman nipples. <laughs> you beat me to the nipples, Nick. <laughs> Darn you. You beat me to the nipples. So, you know, the most exciting part of the entire event, frankly, was, was as, as it always is, the commercials, I think. But, yeah, I thought the double standard with Mr. Levine getting up there, you know, the tats and the nipples. I was like, good for him. And then I started thinking, well, man, I remember Miss Jackson caught so much flack, right, for for a, 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 a boob, a breast with a nipple ring on it for half a second that nobody would have caught if they hadn't made such a big deal about it. And I remember the backlash there. And I was like, you know, we've talked a couple of times about the double standard. And, man, I didn't think that seemed very fair. That was more than a nip slip for sure. He was flaunting them things. I like it. I like it. Any thoughts on the NFL in general? I didn't follow along very much this year. Um, we've talked in the past about how I'm a diehard Cub fan. I'm I'm a Bear fan, but not not nowhere near as much as uh, as I am a Cub fan. So I didn't care for most of the year. Some of that was I don't like the way the owners have treated Mr. Kaepernick. Um, I don't like any infringement on free speech in general, especially when you try to retaliate by basically trying to starve someone out. It didn't work out for them because Nike stepped up in a very calculated move. But I'd love to hear your thoughts. Those are mine. Uh, I echo those thoughts. I've been uh, a little jaded with the NFL for a while now because of their uh, treatment of Kaepernick's protest because I think he's doing what he's doing for very valid reasons. Um, I think they helped push the narrative that was sort of a, a, a misnarrative in that it was sort of anti-U.S. or anti-military, which it 100% was not and was never intended to be. Um, nothing about the military or disrespect of our troops or or anything like that, but certainly about the, the mistreatment of minorities and um, – some police things which we've talked about, um, which I believe are our totally valid concerns. Um, and so definitely didn't like their handling of, la- of that. Um, haven't liked their handling of some of the, the domestic violence things. Um, no steady hand. Um, haven't liked their treatment slash cover up slash disinformation campaign about the the head trauma of 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 past players and the, and the brain scans that we're now seeing. And so look, I like to, I like to watch a football game like, like anybody else, but um, I didn't watch too many football games this year for all of those reasons. And um, that's about it. That's all I really have to say, but I'll tell you one thing that I thought was funny about the Super Bowl, and maybe not funny, but, but eye opening or resonating or whatever word you want to see is I saw a, a bingo card before um, the Super Bowl on Twitter. It was uh, so you could fill out things that you saw, and I, I took just a mental snapshot. I didn't print it out or anything. But as I was watching the Super Bowl, I think I saw nearly every square, and it was like company using someone with a disability to sell a product. Check Microsoft with your new <laughs> with your new video game controller. It was like they were all there, man. It was like I, I just thought it was funny. It, that that's pretty hilarious. You know, I had my first moment, I think, as a parent where I started feeling way older than my kids and just a little context for everybody I'm 40 years old right I have a 20 year old a 15 year old and a 10 year old I'm a happy parent of three amazing boys and my 10 year old says I'm going to a concert and I'm going what you're not going to a concert by yourself you're 10 years old and he says I know where we're going you know where I'm going and he says no no it's a virtual concert I said what He said, yeah, everybody's going to a virtual concert. It's going to be like a 12-minute concert. And I said, okay, well, can I sit in on this thing? And he goes, yeah. So I go upstairs, and I'm thinking he's going to log in to an actual concert, right? And no, what it was was a Fortnite concert, and Mm -hmm. everybody got to log in and participate. And 
they had like dance moves, right? They were Millie rocking and they were like doing the running, man. And I, I was sitting there just feeling old as all hell, man. The kids were having the time of their life. Um, they came out of it. He came out of it and his cousin came out of it acting as if they had just been to the most incredible music experience ever. And I just looked at my wife. She looked at me. We shook our heads and I said, oh, man, the times are a changing. Um, I would love to talk for five minutes about this, if you don't mind. Do you know who the concert was for? Do you know who was performing the concert? Oh, I, 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 the name escapes me. I, I did when I went and saw it, but go fire away. So it's an electric dance uh, music yeah, DJ, I guess you would call it EDM, electric dance music. Mm -hmm. uh, the DJ's name is Marshmallow, and um, he wears a marshmallow on his head. And um, no, this, this really relates to capital and investing. So last March, I was in Southern California at the Roth Capital Conference, mm -hmm. um, and they had a panel about um, modern marketing, uh, digital marketing, social marketing, and this kind of stuff. And... The guy who created the marshmallow brand, one of um, one of them anyway, was was on the panel. And this kid, I call him a kid. I think you know he's our age, 35, 40 years old. I mean, this is a multi hundred million dollar business endeavor. This isn't about electronic dance music. This is about, um, like you say, uh, having 10 million kids at a concert in Fortnite. I mean, that's how many people attended the concert. Um, that you're talking about on the on the Fortnite game, 10 million individuals. I mean, that's incredible. That's and nuts. if you just Google marshmallows, or marshmallow DJ will put up a link. I mean, hundreds of millions of views on YouTube. Incredible, incredibly monetizing this this thing. Um, and just two more sentences, I guess. Um, also in the Super Bowl, we saw uh, Ninja featured. That's the guy who made over $10 million playing Fortnite last year, who we've talked about um, on this podcast. And so definitely uh, uh, a very real thing. Um, and a girl who watches uh, our two girls sometimes. I say she's a girl, but again, she, she's my age, 30 or so. Um, has a master's degree, married uh, her husband. Her and her husband really big into gaming. They'll be going in a couple of weeks to to San Francisco for the Twitch conference. Um, and Twitch is the website uh, where you can watch other people play video games and has some of the highest engagement rates of, of any website uh, on the web. So um, look, the industry is here. It's growing. We've talked about it before. I find it fascinating. Um, and it's something to keep tabs on. Very interesting. Yeah, quick fact too, just uh, on, on, on a side note that's directly related. My 20 year old was at that that Twitch conference last year he likes to stream and you know he's got his own channel set up and and, and thoroughly enjoys it and so yeah he I, I remember he sent pictures he actually got to meet Ninja and sit in on a panel on a private panel I'm um, talking to them about how to monetize their content and how to protect it and how to balance it all out and how to how to make sure that you also have a backup plan and he was blown away so yeah that's not a trend that is going um, well, let me rephrase that. That's a trend that's going in the right direction as far as being able to capitalize, monetize, and, and mobilize uh, people because, man, the reach is incredible. Incredible. Absolutely. It's global for sure. No that's language barrier there. Right. Right. That's a perfect segue into my, my next question. Um, you know, I, I for months, I said that in 2019, at most, you would probably get one interest rate hike and that we needed that in order for the Fed to, to, to reload a little bit, to have some ammo. And then I thought that the Fed would pivot. And man, did the Fed capitulate. I mean, that was one of the quickest pivots I've seen to what amounted to, you know, pretty a, a pretty minimal uh, reversal in the stock market. But, you know, everybody's now, I mean, Yellen came out and said that there may be an interest rate cut during the next meeting that that was a possibility and there are and i always catch this before it happens the wall street journal the forbes the business insider all the think tanks they're starting to float the negative interest rate idea coming to the u.s you think we're getting negative interest rates here in the next year or two i've said before i'm, I'm not the closest fed watcher although uh, I know you were writing late last year and early this year, and, and I wrote in January that we could likely see cuts or pauses before we saw increases. And, and sure enough, Jerome Powell came out on what the mainstream media is calling a dovish pivot. They've removed the mention of further, further gradual increases uh, from their Fed statement. 
Um, and yeah, I think that they're just preparing for, for a, a recession that is long overdue now. Um, and they knew that they were out of bullets or had no tools left in the box or, you know, whatever analogy you want to use there. And by raising rates a couple of points last year, they, they, they knew that they would uh, be able to knock them back or, or, or then take them negative. And so certainly negative interest rates are, uh, a monetary policy tool that, that I wouldn't rule out for the, for the Federal Reserve in the U.S. No, um, uh, of course, that's tied to, to economic performance and indicators. But yeah, no, if things get ugly on the on the recession and economic front, I, I certainly think you could um, see us go to, to negative interest rates. Well, I see Europe in trouble. They've tried it. I see Japan in trouble. They've tried it. Um, for those of us that speculate in the junior resource space and more specifically the precious metal space, I don't think it's a coincidence that we're now putting in a good floor above that $1,300 level in the gold space. And I tell you, if, uh, if, if negative interest rates are coming here to the U.S., look out because you're going to see historic highs in the gold market in the coming years. I'm not I'm, I'm talking real highs not you know inflation adjusted highs like everybody always quotes so something to watch there i'll say this it interrupts the business cycle um it makes the end game that much more predictable it just puts it off for a little bit we talked last week about you know the politicians that speak out of both sides of their mouth and and how it's just simple math that we're not going to grow our way out of the debt that we have here in the u.s that we're likely the cleanest dirty shirt I think, you know, the, the, the writings on the wall for Europe, I think they fall first and, um, yeah, it should be an interesting next couple of years. I, I couldn't agree more. I've never seen a rip your face off, uh, precious metals or commodity bull market. Um, uh, I wouldn't say biding my time, but getting my ducks in a row for, for when that time finally comes. And like you say, the outcome is, is as clear as it can be. I think for, for people like us, not everyone shares that. Um, or is an agreement on what the outcome is going to be. But like you say, I, I think it's pretty clear it's going to take uh, much higher gold prices, a, a, a flight to a flight to safe haven when, when things start to hit the fan. And if you, if you talk to some people, even perhaps a, a return to some sort of quasi precious metal standard to help um, get rid of some of this debt. Yeah, and, and I'm one of these people that thinks eventually maybe there will be a basket of currencies that, that includes gold, um, but I think that's far off. I think the institutions have to, some of some of the better known institutions have to burn down before that's even considered anything that is tied to something like gold is incredibly deflationary. And the one thing that all central banks f fear is deflation. That's why we're having this conversation about the potential for negative interest rates. I think that, you know, the big mega trend to watch there is the pivot from public assets like bonds and treasuries, right, into private assets like gold, like art, like real estate in the right areas. And so, you know, somebody that's really ahead of that trend and does amazing work is a gentleman by the name of Martin Armstrong. I read his stuff almost every day. I'll put a link up, but he can explain it much better than I can. And he's got decades worth of research if anybody's interested in that. Well, you're seeing it happen now. It seems like every couple of months we get the new um, world record priced painting that has uh, been sold. I think Sotheby's is having another pretty big auction here in a, in, a, in another couple of months, if, if not this month. And you're also seeing uh, what you mentioned uh, with your first sentence there in um, mainstream investors turning towards alternative assets and safe havens. We saw Sam Zell, billionaire investor, um, last week or the week before, I think it was, come out and saying he was buying gold for the first time ever as a safe haven investment. And so you're starting to see those um, signs in the market and the headlines on CNBC, whatever you want to call it now. Well said. Well said. I'm looking at property as 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 we speak uh, here in Texas. You know, we're, we're a low tax state. Um, it, it's a state which has an economic boom. The, the, the part of the world that I live in, Austin, and more specifically, Round Rock, is absolutely booming. Um, I know you have uh, quite a holding there in Spokane. Uh, how, how, how are things coming along on that front, Nick? Uh, Spokane is, is booming as well. I was reading about uh, a chamber of commerce meeting in what was what is called the West Plains. That's a, a couple of towns just west of the, the main Spokane downtown. And these three towns are saying 
Um, they're expecting a lot of growth. Um, uh, the amount of growth that they thought was going to materialize by 2030, they think is going to materialize by like 2022. Hmm. Um, something like five to 10,000 people coming into these small towns. Uh, and at the same time, there's only 30 houses for sale in these three towns um, that are two bedrooms or more, less than a quarter million dollars. And, sh- and so um, we're staring at a, at a housing crunch in the Spokane regional area. I was reading another article about the what they call the University District, but it's really just Gonzaga downtown. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love that. Um, it, it, they're facing a housing crunch as well because the the university is growing and um, neighborhoods are turning over fast, but but not fast enough. And so downtown proper also um, needs housing, and prices are going up very fast. I have a. Uh, um, a, a lady, a woman who comes and works for me here a couple of days a week, um, and she. Uh, has lived in her house just for a couple of years, put it for sale. Not only did she make $30,000 in in profit on the house, I think in something like 18 months or two years, but had five offers the first day that they put their house for sale. Um, Gracious, five I've, offers I, on I, the first day? Yeah, it's kind, it's kind of crazy, man. And so I've talked to a couple of real estate agents and, and other people that are looking for houses and or selling houses and routinely getting offers above asking price. I mean, yeah, so Spokane is definitely a booming, a booming market. I have, uh, yeah, like you said, I got I have some acres here. I have like 43 acres and I'd, I'd be interested in, in buying more either – um, for rental income or to, as, as you've advised and, and talked about, um, you know, buying land on the outskirts of town and, and waiting for zoning to change or doing some minor development that allows it to be sold to a developer at a higher price. Um, I'm exploring all those things for sure. Excellent. Excellent. What do you think about this whole Jeff Bezos? Is it Bezos or Bezos? It's Bezos, right? <laughs> Is it GIF or GIF? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. But what do you think about this whole approach? I, I'm i going to give you my short take, and then I'm going to tell you what made me laugh. Um, I love that he said, look, everybody already knows this is true. Let me get out in front of this. And I, I, I wouldn't play chicken, monetary chicken, financial money chicken with the world's richest man. I don't know about you, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on this whole thing. I don't have too many thoughts. Um Similar to what you said, it sounds like he got ahead of it. He told the inquirer he didn't care. And quite frankly, good, right? Because I think it's time as a society we move past this. It sounds like everybody's got naked pictures out there from Jennifer Lawrence to to the Kardashians to Jeff Bezos. And so, um, you know, they're going to get leaked at some point. They're going to be tried to held held against you at some point. I think it's time we should just move past this and, and say, so what if you sent somebody naked pictures? You know, I mean... I get out of here if he was if he was married or not that's not the conversation I'm having but to let a newspaper you know hold you hostage because they have inappropriate text or inappropriate pictures no I'm glad he stood up to him the the ironic part I saw was um <laughs> Him complaining a bit about the privacy when he's got Alexa snooping <laughs> on everybody that's an Amazon member. You want to hear what I thought was funny as hell and and the ironic part from my funny twisted seven year old child sense of humor brain. Let me hear. Uh, Bezos getting blackmailed about his pecker by a guy with the last name of Pecker. <laughs> Uh, that was hilarious the guy's name that was trying to extort him allegedly is david pecker and i you know outside of the divorce thing um i found it absolutely hilarious i thought that was funny as all heck stranger than stranger than fiction right absolutely you know what i didn't find funny as heck what's that Virginia trying to keep up with florida for the craziest state in the country what the hell is going on in virginia uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know too much about the lieutenant governor. I, I saw the the blackface thing um, from, I don't know what it was, in the 80s or whatever. Um, and then I know you want to talk about the, the, the Florida lady politician who was licking men's faces. I do, I um, do, but we, 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 we got it. It's Virginia versus Florida right now. And let me go on record right now saying for, for people outside of the U.S., Florida in our country has the reputation of being... The state where crazy goes to happen on a very 
frequent basis, right? And so Virginia was trying to, you know, stake their claim here the last week or two. It's been an absolute mess. Um, the governor has been called on to resign after a page from his 1984 med medical school yearbook surface showing a photo of a man in blackface and a KKK robe. Um, not good. Um, that's the governor, right? Then the lieutenant governor, Justin Fairba F Fairfax, has been accused of sexually assaulting a woman. And this is not funny. Um, at the 2004 Democratic National Convention. So not only is racism not funny, but sexual assault sure in the hell isn't funny. Follow that up with the Attorney General of Virginia, Mark Herring, admitting to dressing in blackface during his time at the University of Virginia. And then just recently we found out that Senate Majority Leader Tommy Norment, I believe is his name, um, you know, oversaw a yearbook along with like six or seven co-editors in 1968 featuring a host of racist photos and slurs, um, you know, anti-Semitic anti slurs, anti-Asian slurs, anti-African-American slurs, you name it, it was in there. So I don't know what in the world is going on in Virginia, but man, it's coming in bunches. Breaking news on Twitter while we recorded, the lieutenant governor of Mississippi has now been shown to have worn blackface. <laughs> and this, you back, know, go ahead, Nick. Back in the day. And so I just, let's draw a line, right? Because yep. um, we've done the whole, let's remove every single Confederate statue. Let's try to rewrite history. Those people are dead. They don't affect anything that's going on right now. My view on that is that you shouldn't try to rewrite history. Um, you don't have to revere those people. You don't have to talk about those people. But I don't think removing statues and, and looking backward helps anyone move forward. Um, and as far as this blackface thing goes, um, that we got to draw a line again. If you're if you're wearing back blackface and wearing a KKK robe, that's different than wearing blackface, uh, pretending to be Michael Jackson and doing the moonwalk in the early '80s. Um, and so I, I don't want to I don't want to say we gotta we gotta make everyone resign who wore blackface. We gotta go on a blackface witch hunt. I think that if it was shown to be racist or you are a racist or had racist tendencies in the past or published racist racist writings, then of course let's talk about condemnation. But if you were at a Halloween party, uh, and this gets into some of the fake outrage that um that I often talk out about. Um, if you were just at a Halloween party pretending to be a rapper or Michael Jackson, then I think that's quite, quite different. And I think that just is common sense. And I think the distinction's important. It's one thing to be insensitive, right? Let me let me be ignorant and throw on some blackface and pretend to be Michael Jackson. And and maybe you don't even know that that's what you're doing, that, that you're being insensitive, right? You just think that you're being Michael Jackson. And, and again, my childish brain goes to, it's funny that people would wear blackface to be Michael Jackson because he did the opposite. <laughs> right? But anyway, that's a whole other story. But that's very different from a medical school yearbook where the guys got a KKK robe and no doubt. Right. Like, and, and, and the, the broader implication there isn't just one guy. There's racist people everywhere. I believe in free speech, right? I believe that if you have an opinion, if you can articulate it respectfully and without threats of violence, then good for you. You go ahead and speak it. I don't have to agree. You say what you say and keep it moving. But when you are in medical school, can you imagine, you know, the, the, the minority students that are in this medical school, in this medical school, and we've talked about it in the past about having an equal seat at the table and how it's important to lobby and how it's important to organize because of the fact that, you know, the country's origins lend themselves to be what they lend themselves to be. Um, but that's really the broader implication. The fact that we have lieutenant governors, attorney generals, people that are in line to take power that may or may not still believe these things, voting on laws, voting on voter registration laws, voting on mandatory minimums that disproportionately affect minorities and low-income whites, right? And, and that's really the broader implication of all this. And I think with all the sensationalism that the media gets away with now, it's important to focus on why people should be outraged about some of this stuff. And that's really the broader point to me, the more important one. Why do you think people, uh, how did these guys get elected? Is it just that none of this 
um, supposed racism is reflected in their public persona, because you would think after a lifetime in politics and of writing laws and being a legislator that if you had racial, racial tendencies, that those would be public and then the public wouldn't vote you into office unless they tended to agree with your worldview. Um, that's, that's point A. And point B is the did nobody do investigative journalism on this guy before he was elected? Because that seems like the time to do it. And th that's just, you know, me talking out loud. Yeah, no, two excellent questions. Let me try to give you my take on each of those. A and again, I think we talked about this in the first or second episode about how hard it is to even get a seat at the table or learn how to become a city councilman if nobody on the city council is willing to to mentor somebody that doesn't look or think like them, right? And so, again, because, and, and I think we touched on this when we talked about the founding fathers, if all we have are powerful white men at the table, at the country club, talking policy, and everybody shares similar views, nobody's going to leak those similar views. If you then have a media that is predominantly white or very similar minded. Nobody is going to do the digging that is required to get this stuff out. And this is where I believe that whether we're talking sexism or racism, it's important to call bullshit when we see bullshit because it shouldn't have a place anywhere because it has broader implications. And I just think that the bottom line is for a long time, it's easy to put up a good face and clean someone up in public if nobody in private is willing to stand up to the bullshit that goes on. Police. Uh, Priests. There. Police. Priest. Go on. We can continue, right? There was a there was an article about the church uh, here, the Catholic Church, which, you know, now the nuns are finally speaking up. And again, it's absolutely horrible that they were alongside kids raped. Why weren't the nuns speaking up for, you know, all these decades when it was happening to them and, and these kids? Why now? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have I don't have a good answer. I think um, much more global connectivity, um, easier to find people, research people, connect things and, and, and track people. But just a general shift shift in 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 global and local and, and regional sentiment as well. I mean, look at the contingent of women that just were elected to the to the U.S. Congress. You saw them all wearing white in the State of the Union early, early, earlier this week, the most women in Congress ever. I mean, that's great to see. It's good stuff. You can see it sort of starting to change in, in, in real time if, if you look for it. But um, to, to answer a question like, why didn't they speak up for the past couple of decades? I mean, that's something that, I don't know, maybe we could get a guest on to talk about. I don't have an answer for that would be excellent. And, and by the way, for anyone listening, if you ever want to come on and send us an email, uh, tweet to us on our, on, on our Twitter accounts, and we'd be happy to talk with you and have you on. Uh, all, we, we, we take everybody. You have an opinion. Let's, let's, let's talk about it. So back to my earlier point. Let, let's switch gears a little bit into something that did make me laugh. Florida's attempt to push back on Virginia and say, you think you got crazy? You don't got crazy. <laughs> what is Florida? We do crazy every day. This is one of the most hilarious stories that I've read in a long time. And I'm going to tell the story, and hopefully you don't mind me taking my time. I'm going to read it a little bit at a time. This is an article from the Washington Post, right? Just keeping uh, with the whole oh, I, I, I read it. <laughs> well, for those of you who have not, let me share with you. It was supposed to be a fun, lighthearted alternative to typical government meetings and one befitting a laid-back beach town. The City Commission of Madera Beach, Florida, a coastal community of nearly 4,500 situated on a barrier island facing the Gulf of Mexico, had decided to hold a special outdoor meeting during the King of the Beach Fishing Tournament in November 2012. The main order of business, honoring a sister city in the Bahamas. But being Florida, I added that, things got quickly out of hand at the meeting, according to a report from the Florida Commission on Ethics. By her own admission, Nancy Oakley, a city commissioner in Madera Beach, had done some drinking at the fishing competition. She spotted Shane Crawford, the city manager at the, at the time, and Cheryl McGrady, his executive assistant. The two would later marry, because of course, <laughs> the of course be my comment, but were in relationships with other people at the time. Oakley suspected them of having an affair. 
Using expletives, she demanded McGrady, who was supposed to be acting as deputy city clerk and taking the minutes, be removed. Then, after the otherwise low-key meeting concluded, Oakley walked up to Crawford again. She allegedly licked his neck and the side of his face, slowly working her way up from his Adam's apple, and groped him by grabbing at his crotch and buttocks. <laughs> McGrady, who had been standing there the entire time, told Oakley that her behavior was inappropriate. According to the report, Oakley threw a punch at the woman, but missed. It wasn't an isolated incident. Oakley had a habit of licking men that either she was attracted to or thought that she had authority over. That's the short version of the story, Florida. Congratulations, you still hold the prize for crazy, batshit craziest state in the country. And until somebody can prove otherwise, that's that's what I'm sticking to. Any thoughts on that? I know you had read it prior to. It, it sounds like she was king of the beach that night. <laughs> well, apparently not just that night. She had a habit well, of licking people on the face. That was my next point. This was not an isolated incident. <laughs> because if you read what the judge has to say yeah, down at the bottom, he says, there is no way that multiple people made up such a crazy behavior. <laughs> oh, man. All right, everybody. Uh, that, that was a story that made me laugh. And, and after, you know, all the fuckery coming out of Virginia, I thought I thought we could share a laugh where, you know, luckily the punch missed and unfortunately somebody got licked and grabbed, but you know, it, it, <laughs> I'm glad it didn't escalate from there. <laughs> what else do you want to talk about, Nick? What do I want to talk about? Well, I wanted to talk about, let's talk about something else funny and then we'll get serious again. I wanted to talk about fake eyelashes because mm. um, I saw that they were like a quarter billion dollar industry in 2018 the other day. And that just blew my mind, like over 200 and, $50 million in fake eyelash sales. And so I don't know. I just wanted to mention it. I wanted to say that we've had a series of college aged babysitters at our house over the past year or so. And I will say that every single one of them has been donning um, fake eyelashes. And I'm not just talking about like, Oh, I, my eyelashes are short. Let me put on these that make them look uh, a normal length to give me more confidence. I'm talking about these are some Betty Boop ass motherfuckers. <laughs> like they're like an inch and a half long. And so and sometimes when the girls are just in like, you know, like sweatpants or yoga pants, like not going to the prom or whatever. And so I was just thinking like they were leaving them on from the night before going out or, you know, whatever. I didn't know that this was like a, a thing in a, in a quarter billion dollar industry. And then. Uh, this week on Twitter, I saw an article about it, um, how women are now wearing them to the gym. So, you know, they're, <laughs> they're putting on they're putting on makeup and fake eyelashes at the gym because it gives them more confidence. And and my take was and also so that they can post their gym selfies, which we we know that people go to the gym. Um, they let us know that we go that they go to the gym on social media. Oh, they let us know anyway. when we're there, too. I, I had a story <laughs> from my wife a couple of weeks ago where I, I was I was on the treadmill. Right. I try to get a good workout in a day. And, you know, it varies from boxing to weightlifting. But anyway, so I'm in the gym and, you know, there's always at least like the one like cute girl that knows she's the cute girl. Right. And like is there to make sure everybody, guys and gals know that she's the cute girl. And the funniest thing to me is. When another girl walks in, that is clearly to most people, the cuter girl, the look on girl number one's face. <laughs> it's absolutely hilarious to me. Mm. <laughs> when, fight, yeah, when the outfit and the eyelashes on girl number one don't stack up to the outfit or the eyelashes of girl number two and everybody in the room acknowledges that, the faces each of those make make me laugh and, and, and makes my wife laugh, frankly. So anyway, <laughs> I digress. Back to you. Well, I just don't know where it came from. I mean, is this uh, is this something that came from like you know Kardashian Cardi B on down, or is this is this? I, I just don't know why. I just don't understand it. Maybe I'm old. I don't know. We 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 may be old. I will say this. You know, you brought up Cardi, and and you know, for those of you not familiar with Cardi B, she is an artist that you know just a year and a half or two years ago. Uh, was stripping for a living and nothing wrong with stripping for a living. Everybody has to make a living, right? Um, 
And here we are two years later, and, you know, it's rumored that her net worth is over $100 million, And, you know, she had a Super Bowl commercial with Pepsi. Those are huge endorsements. She's got fashion lines. Um, she was on the cover, I think, of one of the major fashion magazines this last week. She's been able to monetize her personality into triple-digit millions, right? That's really impressive. Um, you know, anything above $100 million, uh, deserves attention. When we talk about the Kardashians, you know, everybody likes to just point it. And we've done it, right? We've joked the fake butts and everything else. But the bottom line is every single one of those young ladies has, has turned – Whatever situation they were born into and multiplied it in in, in in rapid fashion, I think one of the Jenner young ladies has like the best-selling cosmetics line in, in the country and, and, and is well into being a billionaire, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, when we talk about the Twitch conferences and the gamers and the youth cosmetic lines, fake eyelashes, all of this, I don't know if it's just a different time or if we're just having and making creating smarter entrepreneurs because they are monetizing like no other and, and kudos well, to them and monetizing in different ways right i mean you hear about these youtube billionaires and youtube stars and yeah yeah it's all very interesting one thought that popped in my head though is i did see cardi made some political tweets um a couple of weeks ago uh, i think anti-trump in some respect and the one thing that pops in my head when i see these videos like did you see the twerk video that came out with her and, and nikki the other week I did. where they like they were they like recruited the best twerkers in the country and then they filmed them shaking their asses on the you know on the boat the boat and the yacht and wherever else they could get them to shake their ass on car hoods and wherever um and you got like tens of millions of girls or if not hundreds of millions of girls looking up to these. And then we have like, I don't know, I just want to juxtapose it against the Me Too movement, movement and say that those two things aren't necessarily um, congruous. And, and, and maybe that's me having a closed mind, but I, I, I don't know. Thoughts? I'll, I'll take the other side of that, actually. I'll say that I love... Liberated? See, yeah, I love yeah. it. I love seeing a young woman being able to be in a video celebrating her sexuality without you know invading on anybody's space or privacy or, or any of that and simultaneously being a mom and simultaneously being an entrepreneur and also flipping that into a hundred million dollar fortune i think the fact that society is allowing all those things to happen is very empowering and you know the me too movement is a separate conversation the bottom line is if a woman were to walk into my home naked that wouldn't give me permission to just automatically touch her sure. or in any shape way or form do anything that's inappropriate right um so I, I think they're separate things but i do think it's liberating i do think that it's 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 good to see and you know hopefully they're responsible with those platforms as 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 they evolve as artists i see what jay-z for example has done back from three decades ago when he was selling drugs to now he just launched a $50 million fund with some very well-known celebrities and, and you know, the owner of the New England Patriots is in there. Meek Mill rapper is in there. And it's all about addressing criminal justice. So I think being able to allow people to grow is important. I think that we should separate artists from people. And I like it. I, I you know, I think if, if, if you can put on a good twerk, and then put your mom hat on and then put your businesswoman hat on and do all that effectively. Good for you. Point taken. Um, you don't have daughters. I have two daughters. I'm not sure that that's the most, you know, that's Agreed. not what I would point to, to to tell her that she could do anything with her life. Although I, I get the point for sure. Oh, and I completely get it. I mean, I have two nieces, you know, and, and, and I get I get the personal take on it. But from a broader perspective, I think, you know, I think obviously it's important to, to differentiate between the two. And now, you know, it goes back to the conversation about do we agree? You know, there's politics that I believe in where me personally, I'm completely against on a personal note. But I don't think government should be able to come in and tell me that I can or can't do it. Right. Do I think that cocaine should be illegal? No. Now, I've never done cocaine. It's not my drug of choice. Right. Not my thing. But I don't think the government should tell me that I can't do cocaine if I wanted to do cocaine in my own house. I think that, you know, criminalizing cocaine and the weapons that go into countries like Mexico and, you know, the chaos that's brought on as a result of the war on drugs, I think we could look at that 30, 40 year track record and see what that's done. So, you know, that's one of those things where I, 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 I can disagree with what's happening on a personal level and say, hey, to my nieces, 
they better not catch you doing that or that's not what you should be doing or that's not healthy because of this and you know how you may be perceived these are the consequences of that but i don't think we should demonize it and and take credit away from the other positives that come with 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 that if that makes sense well said you talked about cocaine i want to talk about pot a bit um it's a heck of so, a segue. Oh, i like it over the past couple of call it since October when um, Canada legalized. I've just been seeing an a, increasing amount of news stories um, about rights and also here in the United States because there's uh, a whole laundry list of states now where cannabis is legalized recreationally. And so let me just tell you some of the things that I've been seeing and, and I guess I'd love to hear your thoughts so we can talk about it further. Um, one, I've seen... Uh, the cannabis industry and dispensary owners put out, um, I guess you would call it information, but um, I'd call it a warning saying, hey, mm. if we take credit, that's cool. You can pay in credit, but for your own privacy sake, you might want to pay in cash. That's interesting to me. Um, why is why is getting caught smoking pot a bad thing if it's completely legal. Same thing with the twerking, right? If it's legal, but maybe you don't want to be associated with the the repercussions of getting caught and being branded as a, as a pot smoker. I just think that's one interesting um, facet. I've also seen a lot about um, how are we going to um, catch or prove driving under the influence? And so Canada has passed a bill um, saying that cops can take um, sobriety test without reasonable suspicion because it's not like alcohol where you can you can smell it or maybe not even um, notice someone acting differently. So now they can perform sobriety tests without reasonable suspicion. Um, I've seen in Canada people pushing for the use of swabs um, where you could swab someone's hands or backpack or brownie to see if there was THC in it. And I've seen people advocating for the use of this in... Um, school settings. And then here in the States, um, there's a framework that's not yet developed or mature yet because it's not, legalization is not nationwide and it's a, it's a patchwork of laws. So for example, in Portland, it's legal to take weed on a plane <laughs> if you're flying within the state. So if you're flying or in Oregon, excuse me. So if you're flying from Portland, Oregon to Salem, Oregon, um, you're allowed to take weed on the flight, but it's federally illegal and you have to go through the TSA so the TSA can take it. Um, and I guess you could technically be arrested there, even though it's legal to fly with it. And it's so, um, and the same with driving state to state, like here in, in Eastern Washington, we're 15 minutes from the Idaho border. Um, you know, you can play hopscotch and on one side you're, you're legal with an eighth in your pocket and you, mm -hmm. you take the next hop and you're going to, and you're going to jail. So, um, I don't know. I, I think one, this is a, a, a warning. Be, be careful. Um, if you're a pot consumer and um, you don't want to have a record of it or you don't want an insurance company to know about it down the road when they buy the financial records from the credit card company, because we all know that happens. Um, two, I would say um, from an investment standpoint, also a warning. Uh, there's been stories about uh, people saying they were pot investors or cannabis investors or even users uh, crossing between Canada and the United States and being uh, banned from entry to the uh, United States if they're Canadian and having troubles getting into Canada if you're U.S. and say you're a pot investor. So, mm -hmm. uh, for example, I drove up there in September, I think it was, to see a, a, a grow facility in British Columbia. I didn't mention any of that at the border. I said I was going to. <laughs> I was going to ask you, did you tell them that? <laughs> No, I said I was going. I was going to visit a, a mining company and interview management. Didn't say anything about cannabis or, or anything. And then also from an investor standpoint, I guess I would say it's a sign that um, you know people are starting to to say, "Have I missed the boat? Is it too late to buy cannabis stocks?" And it's like I don't think so. We haven't even worked out like a legal framework for legalization. There's still shortage shortages in Canada. There's still well over half the states that have to to legalize. And so I think these are definitely growing pains for sure, but something to be conscious of. Yeah, I think um, my short, quick take on it: one, anytime government is given any government, Canadian, American, you name it, Venezuelan, Mexican. Um, anytime government is given or afforded an opportunity um, where there is a gray area, they're going to err on the side of abusing your privacy and your rights, especially if 
those haven't been fully articulated in a way that where they hold legal ground. And so my second quick take is we talk a lot about lobbying and organizing on this podcast. I think the pioneers in the space, the people that are looked at, the corporations that are going to take this to the mainstream need to get ahead of this now and start putting some lobbyist dollars to setting up a very rigid and transparent legal framework that everybody's going to operate on or you're going to have situations where states and attorney generals are going to be acting out of personal belief and incarcerating the easiest people to incarcerate in order to line the pockets of those that vote for things like private prisons and or states that are in trouble financially that see this as a way to collect federal income. That's my short take on it. But I I expect and I hope that the people that are considered leaders in the industry are, I I hope they're racing to, to, to that finish line that, that sets up a legal framework that's clear as day to everybody. I'm looking at you, Mississippi, Missouri, Arkansas, and Alabama. Yep, and Texas. <laughs> what else you got? You want to do? Um, I want to ask you about something um, that I saw you tweet about this weekend that I didn't really um, know too much about, and that's gun deaths in Alaska. Unfortunately, where they were the highest per capita of any state. I think I got that statistics uh, correct. And you had lived there, and you said that's not surprising to anyone who lives there. Why is that? It's not, you know, it isn't the first year it's happened. I think it's, um, and you know, someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but I know we've been top three, let's say top five for at least the last seven years. And, you know, it's not only gun deaths in Alaska, it's sexual assault. We're like twice. Um, and I say we, as in the state of Alaska, I lived there for 17 years. Um, you know, Alaska's at twice the, 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 the normal rate and, and the rate in the U S is already high. So, you know, Alaska, for those not familiar is a state that landmass wise is about twice the size of Texas, but only has 700,000 people in the entire state. So less than the city of Austin, for example, um, less, just, just, just under half of those live in Anchorage, Alaska, which is the main city. And the bottom line is, look, the access to guns, In Alaska, the access to drugs um, is unlike any other place, frankly, that I've ever been to. And I spent a large part of my childhood and go back to Chicago every year. It's more work to get an AK in Chicago than it is in Alaska. Um, You throw in nine months of darkness and snow and cold and you throw in a lot of alcohol, a lot of drugs, and it's just a recipe for disaster. Um, The other thing I'll say, and and something that contributed to this, I don't want to say it caused it, but, you know, about 10 to 12 years ago, and this is part of why we moved, me having three boys. You mentioned having two daughters. I had three boys. Um, I kind of saw the trend as far as the city went, but, but the city, the city and the state really moved away from funding programs that were critical to those that needed it most. So any social safety net um, that existed, and it wasn't a big one, was gutted. Um, And, you know, the government did. We we can have a disagreement about whether there should be taxpayer-funded social nets, safety nets. But the bottom line is the government took that away and then misallocated the capital anyway, which they always do. Um, and, And that led to a spike in you know, homicides, um, shootings, assaults, sexual assaults. It's a mess. Anchorage is, you know, a beautiful place, um, but it's a very dangerous city. And I I, I think, you know, the politicians are a lot to blame there on on both sides. I mean, not just the right, you know, the left too. We had had a mayor that I liked a lot. I I, I know his brother well. Um, We talk, we chat. He ran for governor and and he did a great job for a while. And then he, he, you know, he... He had some pressure and, and ultimately was, was not reelected, and, and that was that. So there's no one answer, but yeah, easy access to guns, easy access to alcohol and drugs, and none of those are, are conducive to low crime rates, right? Yeah, interesting and, and, and a reason to, to pay attention to Alaska outside of when they have a vice presidential candidate or an earthquake or an oil spill for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll put a link up to, to, you know, some of the stats. I mean, I, I don't have enough hand, fingers and toes, um, 
that can count the amount of people that I know that have been killed or have been shot or have been raped in Alaska. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a grim thing to say, but it's a place that I don't miss because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 Mm -hmm. Man, let's talk about something nice, Nick. You got any feel good stories? You're always good at those. You, you, you got any, I got one this week, but you always, no, always was... set that off. Right. All right. I'll do a, just a small one. Um, and then I know you have one you want to talk about. This isn't really a story I saw. This is just um, a, a life anecdote. So I, I saw this Pew study a couple of weeks ago that was asking readers, respondents about their neighbors and how well they thought they knew their neighbors, how much they relied on their neighbors, interacted with their neighbors, considered their neighbors friends, etc. And the the study concluded, or at least the results of the respondent showed from Pew that neighbors in rural areas um, tend to be closer. They interact more than people who live in cities or even in um, suburbs. And I've just noticed that more and more having moved from the suburbs where I could almost, you know, stick my arm at my window and touch both my neighbor's house to a place where I have to really look to see a neighbor's house uh, from my property, like a single person's house. And so... Um, you know, just since I've been here for 18 months, there was, um, one day in everybody's mailboxes showed up, um, an invitation for like a meet and greet at a, a guy's farm down the street. He wanted to host everybody from the street so everybody could meet and exchange phone numbers and powwow and this and that. And, um, there's been a couple new houses built on the road and, you know, go over and give them a dozen eggs cause we have chickens and, and introduce ourselves or, um, you know, the guy with a, a plow truck that lives behind me comes in, comes and plows my driveway without me having to ask. And he says, oh, you know, don't worry about it. I know you'll let me borrow your tractor one year or take me on a duck hunt or, you know, whatever it is. And um, it's just a, a, just a feel good thing. And so the reason it made me think of it is because um, my well froze up this week and I had to have a couple of guys come over. I called the local pump company and they came out and everybody always asked me, what's my area code from? Because it's not the area code that's around here. So whenever you call for service or you call local business, they say, Hey, what's 443 area code. Right. And I say, Oh, that's from Maryland. So one of the guys that comes out, this is going to be a little bit of a long story. Sorry. He says, Oh, I'm from Delaware, which is very, it's a neighboring state to, to, to Maryland. Very similar, obviously culturally. And he's like, <laughs> Welcome to the free side of the country, he says. How do you like it out there? <laughs> and, you know, we, we go on to talking and, and, you know, we love the people. We love the Pacific Northwest, the rivers and the mountains. And, and it got me thinking because my first answer, because everyone asks you, oh, why did you move out here? Why did you move out here? Everyone you meet. And I, for, for the first year, 12 months, 18 months, I was saying – no income tax was the and that was the kind of the truth i was looking at states that didn't have income tax to move to but the more i uh get to see around here and the, and the people i meet and i kind of knew this going into the move but the answer to the question now why did you move out here is not necessarily just the income tax i mean it's the people it's the the pine trees that are I'm staring at my window right now covered in snow it's the the rivers it's the mountains and so yeah like I, I needed a couple bales of hay to insulate my well this week and texted my neighbor. Sure. How many do you need? What time do you want me to bring them over? Do you want to go in the barn and get them yourself? Just that kind of stuff. I think it's good things. Hmm. I like it. You know, it's interesting with social media that, you know, brings so many people together from all over the world. And, you know, in a way I think, um, maybe dilutes the neighbor, the traditional neighbor experience, right? Neighbor relationship. I mean, I'm guilty of it. You know, I speak to my neighbor to the right of me, maybe once a week, twice a week on a Saturday when they're outside and I'm outside with my kids for a little bit. But during the week, you know, it's a wave, you know, we, we wave to the neighbors across the street. And I don't recall the last time we had, you know, a neighborhood cookout or a neighborhood block party. And I know that's something that even growing up in low income areas in Chicago, we did that almost on a weekly basis where we would have neighborhood block parties and everybody would bring food. And, you know, we didn't have a lot, but it was a, it, it was a relatively good experience from that aspect of it. So yeah, I, I, I agree. I think you're on to something there. Thank you. Let me hear about the Lego. You got it. Uh, it's an awesome story. You guys got to hear this one. So there's a teenager. His name is uh, David Aguilar, David Aguilar. And he studies bioengineering at the uh, University Internacional de Catalunya in Spain. Um, so this kid is 19 years old, and he was born without a right forearm. 
due to a rare genetic condition. And what, what this kid did is he built himself a robotic prosthetic arm using Lego pieces. Um, and I just found that to be absolutely fascinating. I'll go ahead um, and put a link up, but you know, the effect that this has had on his life in a positive way made my heart smile and I thought I would share it. Again, I'll, I'll put the link up. You got to see it. This kid obviously has a very, very bright future. Um, he says, you know, this is his fourth model now and he says his dream is to design affordable robotic limbs for people that need them. So if that doesn't make your heart smile, um, yeah, you should probably go do something better with your life, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, incredible. If you can do well by doing good, uh, all the power to you. That's well the goal, done. right? That's the goal. We're going to do a stock of the week this week, Nick. You got anything else for me? I was just going to say, so the last two weeks we ran, I, I had numbers stay in my head for some reason. We went like exactly 57 minutes last year. And so if we each do a quick stock, we could get out of here at for 57 minutes, three, three weeks in a row. It's funny how that works out. I love it. So you want to go first? Sure. It's not mining. I want to talk about light access. They have a proprietary way of installing fiber optic cable specifically in the last mile of installation right up into your home or into a building or an office or a hospital or whatever. Um, I've held shares for, for multiple years now. I've recommended shares to readers. Um, it's been one of those where we've doubled our money, sold it. It sold off hard. They've had some growing pains in the past couple of years. Shares came down really, really hard from something like a dollar, dollar twenty-five down to like thirty-five cents. Mm. Got a new CEO last year. He's been in the market buying hard. He's uh, streamlined operations in the UK where they're generating most of their revenue. I think first quarter sales this year over first quarter sales last year are up something like one hundred and forty percent. Stock has bottomed as high as it's been now since November. And um, it looks like the trend has, has finally changed in the and things are turning around. So light access would be my stock this week. Light access. We'll make sure to put up a link and the ticker symbol. Mine, uh, last week we talked to Ivanhoe and their spectacular copper hit. Um, company that had some incredible news this week, Chicana Copper. Very similar story. They have a 52-week high of about a buck oh five Canadian um, even after this hit, you know, they're trading at about 39 cents. They have a market cap of 30 million. They're out in Peru. Ticker symbol, well done by Mr. David Kelly. The CEO is Peru, P-E-R-U. They intersected 22.8 meters of 2.93 grams per ton gold, 1.37% copper, and get this, 1,283.2 grams per ton silver. So that's about 22.8. That's that, that's a total of like 21.8 grams per ton gold equivalent. Gold equivalent, or, yeah. Yeah, or 14.29% copper equivalent. Absolutely Woo. spectacular hit um, on a new pipe. They have about 17 pipes. They're waiting modification on a permit. It should be a busy summer drilling season. I think the company's a heck of a speculation. Chicana Copper. And I like copper. Dave Kelly is one of the smartest guys I've met in the business. So I'd look into it. It's a... Uh, it merits your attention, everybody. Agree. Shall we end it? Let's do it. 57 minutes once again. It's funny how that works out. Nick, thank you for your time today. Appreciate keeping it going and keeping it insightful and keeping it balanced. This is episode five of Bizarro World. Have a great week, everybody.